have been privileged once again to have Mr. Gita Wiriawan with us today. Mr. Gita Wiriawan is the founder of Ankora Group and former Minister of Trade of uh, the Republic of Indonesia. Mr. Gita Wiriawan is also one of our main keynote speakers this morning. And therefore, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Mr. Gita Wiriawan to the stage. Thank you. Very good morning to all of you. I want to thank Shweb and the IEF for always giving me the opportunity to speak for free. <laughs> I, I need to highlight that because it's rare for anybody to have the honor to basically just share ideas and views. Uh, and, and I do believe that the Indonesia Economic Forum is one of the few fora in Indonesia that would allow people to share opinions that actually matter for not only the present but for the future. Shuab Ebley pointed out the need to co-create, the need to have ideas and innovate. And I'm a big believer of the fact that talent is actually universal it's opportunities that are not. And if you put that in the context of Indonesia, I'm actually very confident that we're gonna have the future Jeff Bezos being born in Toraja, Pulau Samosir, Wamena, and all the cities that you might not even converse about anywhere beyond Indonesia. But the only thing that lacks for he or she that's born in this set of cities is that he or she does not have access to capital. And if you take a look at Indonesia, Indonesia is a place where the financial inclusiveness is only 36%. That is the percentage at which the 15-year-olds and older have a bank account. Okay, it's a stark contrast to whatever you might be seeing in places that are only a few miles away from Indonesia. Singapore has a financial inclusion of 98%. Malaysia has a financial inclusion of 87%. It allows for anybody with good ideas, if not great ideas, to have access to capital. Because without capital, good ideas are just good ideas. They're not going to be ideated, nor executed, nor actualized. But not only is it important to have access to capital, I think it's far more important to have access to patient capital. The reason why Amazon was able to thrive ever since the early 90s by way of the vision of Jeff Bezos because none of the people that put money into Amazon wanted some sort of return. None of the guys that put money into the vision that was articulated in the early 90s wanted anything back in a near foreseeable future. They were willing to take a 20 to 30 year view. They were willing to allow this guy to just keep on tinkering beyond books, onto wedding gowns, onto Walkmans, which turned out to be iPods. Now you can pretty much order anything and get it across your room within a couple of days. Now they're doing stuff that you would never imagine. And the very reason why they've been able to succeed or thrive is because of the patient capital. Patient capital, I think, is far more important for developing theses such as Indonesia. So, with that as a backdrop, I want to take you back 4.6 billion years. That's when the planet was formed. And ever since then, a few hundred million years thereafter, 3.8 billion years ago, simple life form started forming. Then only 600 million years ago, complex life form came about. And the oscillation of temperatures was so big 
that humanity was not able to thrive in a good way only about 11,500 years ago that the oscillation of temperature stabilized that we were able to survive in a moderately good way. And ever since then, the evolution of the Homo sapiens, we're able to start thinking. We're able to evolve into something better. But today, we're confronted with a few dynamics, one of which is basically the gap between Moore's law and humanity. Gordon Moore in the 60s predicted that the memory capacity of a chip was going to double every year and a half or two. And he has been dead accurate. The exponentiality of that growth has been on the ball to this day. And it is likely that it's going to continue for another 20 years. Whereas humanity has not been able to cope with that sort of exponential growth to the point we're seeing tension culturally, socially, politically, regulatorily, because we're not being able to cope with how things are evolving. As a result, you tend to see some protectionist posturing in some countries on the back of some oligarchs who are probably not happy with the way that everything that they've been doing for the last 20 to 30 years has been democratized in such a big way that the regulatory card is being played. And that is a resistance, if not a rejection, to the new thesis of how humanity wants to live going forward. So we've been seeing disruptions. But what's more comfortable is dislocation. Dislocation is when disruptions are taking place to the point where you don't actually feel comfortable with how things are evolving. It's cool to be able to write in a much more efficient, effective manner, financially, physically, but it's not cool when a series of those things are happening to the point where your cousin can't find a job because of this series of disruptions. And geopolitically, things or the world have become more polarized, have become characterized by new phenomena. I call this the era of defined contribution. For the first 50 years beyond World War II, it was called the era of defined benefit. If you took side with Russia or the USSR, or if you took side with the, US, with the United States, it's OK. You can just sit back and receive your military arms, financial aid, economic aid, and whatever assistance you needed. But today, at the rate that there is great powers beyond those two, such as China, India, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and many others, to the point where you've got to work a lot harder to earn whatever you want, be it arms, be it economic assistance. But at the same time, there has been a decline of multilateralism. In the old days, people used to multilateralize conversation for the benefit of better trade better economic cooperation. I can leverage off one of the guys in this room, which has about two to 300 people, for the purpose of getting the max for myself to leverage over the other 199 or 299 people. But if I'm stuck in this room with only one guy and that guy knows my weaknesses, I'm toast. I'm exposed because he's going to be able to squeeze me to get the max out of me. And I'm coming to the table with a position of weakness to the point where I'm not going to be able to max out on what I need from that other guy. So the bilateralism that has permeated into the conversations, into the action of humanity, has made developing economies more inefficient 
more ineffective. And what complicates it more is that the politics and the geopolitics of things are not allowing us to swing back the rubber band from the other end to this end. So some countries, some economies are exposed to inefficiencies which may last for a while. But I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist that that rubber band is going to swing back because of certain centrifugal force of humanity, where it will bring back the force of the rubber band, where we're going to re-attain centrality, which unfortunately in the last few years has kind of like disappeared. People are either on the right side of the game or on the left side of the game. And that distorts the ability with which people can attain capital, like it or not. You either want to go with socialism with Chinese characteristics, or you want to go with liberal democracy. But if you're in the middle, your ability to attain capital is somewhat distorted. That's a fact for many entrepreneurial individuals, groups in the world. And at the same time, the planet is getting warmer. Ever since the first industrial revolution, for 150 years, between the year 1850 and the year 2000, humanity burned 350 gigatons of carbon. 350 gigatons of carbon. But only in a mere 16 year period, between 2000 and 2016, humanity burned the same amount of carbon. 350 gigatons of carbon. And if you go by the Paris climate, which will take place in 2030, in the next 13 years, we're only allowed, the whole planet, with the exception of the US that didn't sign on, we're only allowed to burn 500 gigatons of carbon. So 350 for 150 years, 350 in 16 years, 500 in the next 13 years. And if you talk to the scientists globally, they can come up empirically. How much more carbon is sitting underneath the ground? There's only 3,000 gigatons left. You talk to the CEOs of ExxonMobil, Pertamina, you talk to the scientists at famous universities, there's only 3,000 gigatons. So you imagine if we live with the kind of lifestyle we have been living the last 16 years, we only have a few decades of life and livelihood. So make sure you enjoy that bottle of wine fast. <laughs> Unless and until we come up with alternative means of living or thriving, which we are. You go to Silicon Valley, you go to China, you go to India, you hear these great ideas of how to basically alter the way we live in a much more environmentally friendly manner and on a sustained basis. And these ideas have been attached to capital formation in a very patient way. Indonesia needs to be in that conversation. Indonesia hasn't been a big part of the conversation, but I do believe it takes only a few guys who get it to be part of that conversation. As for all of us in this 250 million people country, to be able to feel it, to breathe it, to bleed it. God forgives. People frequently forgive, but rest assured, nature does not forgive. We saw that. Boxing Day, 2004, 200,000 people died. We couldn't do anything about it in Aceh. And the last bit of how we're seeing the world evolving is the concept of money. People all over the world are getting older. And as a result of aging, savings will pile up in a big way. Demographically, the planet is getting older, faster than ever. Except for India and Indonesia. For the obvious reasons, 
which are largely reproductive in nature. But net-net, people are getting older, savings are piling up. But what's happening at the same time is that the number of asset classes remains finite. With whatever money you got, you can only buy that bottle of wine, you can buy paintings, you can buy stocks and bonds and real estate. That's it. The number of asset classes does not increase. So as a result of the constant nature or the finite nature of asset classes and money going up, the price of money in the next 20, 30 years is only going to come down. Interest rates will come down. Who's going to benefit? A developing country like Indonesia. Unless we do certain things that the world doesn't like. But if we do things or more things that the world likes, the price of money is only going to come down and get cheaper. And this will benefit that guy from Wamena, that guy from Toraja, that guy from Pulau Samosir, who has this brilliant idea. And he wants to attach that idea to this new capital structure that's going to be much more efficient than his father's days, his grandfather's days when borrowing at a bank would have cost them 50%. Now, it's going to be 2%. That changes the game. That changes the conversation. We're part of the tropics. By 2050, five years after the title of this forum, which is 2045, two-thirds of the world's children are going to be in the tropics. And Indonesia represents a big chunk of that. One half of the world population are going to be in the tropics. New economic powerhouses are emerging. You go by the Price Waterhouse report, by so-and-so year, Indonesia's GDP is going to be number four in the world. You extrapolate today's economy at 5% real growth. By the year 2045, Indonesia's GDP on a nominal basis will be at $11 trillion. With a population of 320 million, Indonesia's GDP per capita will be significantly higher than today's. It's at about $30,000 to $35,000. That only proves that mathematically, we're going to be able to break that middle income trap, which is at about six to 8,000 range. So we are blessed with mathematics. But we need to be blessed by those beyond mathematics. We got to act. We got to ideate. We've got to execute. We got to walk the talk. And people take for granted that the world has been peaceful and stable. You know, in the old days, you go, you go back 100 years or 200 years or 300 years, when there was a plague, when there was a war, 15% of the population is taken out. We forget that. But now, you take a look at the statistics, roughly 50 to 60 million people die on a yearly basis. And a good chunk of that is because of diabetes. A good chunk of that is by way of suicides. Not because of war, not because of plague, not because of famine. We have enough to eat. The excess that's left over at all the McDonald's and all the restaurants in the U.S. will be twice the amount of what's needed to feed the hunger in Africa. So we just need to figure out an algorithm that will reallocate resources in a more efficient way so that people in Kansas will be eating the same amount as those in Kenya. MAFGA is a new thing. It stands for Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Google, and Amazon. You add up the market capitalization of these five companies, they add up to more than $3 trillion, larger than the GDP of the UK close to the GDP of Germany. I have not added the other A, which is Alibaba. It's scary, but it's scary good. 
And if you extrapolate these going forward, my God, you know, five out of the top 10 companies in the world right now are tech. All the tech com I mean, all the top 10 companies 15 to 20 years ago were non-tech. Now five, rest assured, in the next five years, probably eight out of the 10 will be tech. And wouldn't it be nice for an Indonesian company to be somewhere in the top 10 by the year 2045, right? Damn, yeah. I call the four companies without Microsoft the four horsemen. There's a book called The Four. And you think, are these guys going to be in contrast with the wishes and aspirations of governments and the states? We're seeing that already in some countries. You saw what happened in London, right, with Uber. You saw what happened here with some of the right-hailing companies, how the regulatory bodies were tempted to do something that was not in accordance to the aspirations of the people, not in accordance to the aspirations of the companies. But at last, the people spoke. The rubber band moved. But at the end of the day, is it going to be a competition between nation states and corporates? Probably not. I think it's going to be a competition between the behemoths or among the behemoths. Be it Amazon against Apple or Google against Facebook. You've got the paradoxes of life. You've got a company that doesn't have an inventory of media being the largest media company in the world by the name of Facebook. That's a paradox. But at the same time, you've got a company that sells more things, goods and services over the internet, not paying sales taxes in many countries, but being revered as the paragon of entrepreneurship. So people are godifying. People are worshiping the new thing. In the old days, when people were confronted with mysteries, they sought answers in the mosque, in the temple, in the churches, in the churches. But now people tend to spend more time looking at their handphone to find and seek answers. It's the new kind of spirituality, isn't it? To what extent do you share with Google secrets that you do not share with your girlfriend, your husbands, or your wives? Can that be called the new kind of spirituality? Which is why I think we're moving from the stage where we were homo sapiens where we were trying to find the means to survive to the new era of new spirituality by way of technological revolutions or evolutions. The global narratives are many. I'm putting up on a page just some. One of which that's near to us is the One Belt, One Road. It's the recreation of what happened in the 14th and 15th centuries. Back then, basically, the Chinese were moving westward to figure out a new way to trade. But right now, the overarching thesis under One Belt, One Road relates to people-to-people -people mobility, relates to transactions, relates to commerce, relates to connectivity, relates to policy, relates to a bunch more things that I think will be great for millions, if not billions, of people around the world. But we're seeing tension. Why? Because of how it might be perceived. It is being perceived somewhat more inorganically. The 14th and 15th century thesis was a lot more organic because the cultural dimension was so rich and richly executed in how they were externalizing and how they were internalizing. But now the pace at which they're doing it seems to be a little faster than some would imagine. And that creates a bit of a tension socially, culturally, and even politically and ge geopolitically. But that, I think, over time, if you take the next 10, 20 year view, it's going to get resolved. 
And as soon as that gets resolved, people will have access to patient capital. As soon as people have access to patient capital, people are going to be able to attach those great ideas to the patient capital. So you're likely to see the creation or the co-creation of the new Amazons, the new Alibabas, the new Googles in this part of the world. ASEAN architecture is another beauty. 50 years of peace. You take for granted peace and stability. Without peace and stability, you can't have economic prosperity. Trust me, if you have war every week, you can't grow economically. And if you go back 2,000 years in ASEAN, ASEAN has been graced by the Indians, by the Chinese, by the Middle Eastern, by many people around the world. We saw for 400 years, between the year 400 and 800, Buddhism thrived by way of the visitation by the Chinese and the Indians. Relative peace and stability. 600 years thereafter, Hinduism thrived by way of the influence from India. And then, ever since the 1500s, Islam has thrived. This is where we were, the Homo sapiens. The Homo sapiens are contemplating what we're going to do next, how we're going to figure out a way to transport ourselves faster. Fire was the first technological disruption. And some people at that time thought fire was going to be hazardous because they're going to kill themselves if they get burnt. But humanity figured out a solution to get around that hazard. And fire has become one of the most useful tools of humanity. And if you think singularity, which is really the amalgamation of machination and humanity, will be hazardous, it's OK. It's almost the same way that we thought about fire when it came about as the first technological disruption. But singularity, I think, will be net beneficial to humanity going forward. If you go to Silicon Valley in San Francisco, there's a guy by the name of Kurzweil. I'm a big fan of his because he came up with the first cool synthesizer. I was a musician a long time ago. And this guy is the head of basically creation at Google. He's trying to figure out a way for people to live until they're 500 years old. Now, the question is, would you want to be 500 years old? I'm not so sure. You're going to be playing golf until you're 500 years? You're going to be playing bridge until you're 500 years? That's the kind of conversation. If you take a look at Silicon Valley, compare that with China, China is an amazing place. I was there until a few days ago. The kind of intellectual property that exists there is probably not like the kind that you would see in Silicon Valley. But the application is massive, which is why if you talk to every Chinese in China, they argue that Alibaba is going to super, I mean, surpass uh, Amazon. And their argument, which is cleverly articulated, is the user experience. If you go to China, you go to the internet, the user experience is a lot chip, uh, richer. They transact, they traverse in the internet a lot more than on average people do in the US. This is not a debate between the Americans and the Chinese. But I'm just laying out that the massive applicability of intellectual property in China, I think is likely to be replicated in places like Indonesia because of the cultural dimension as we have seen in the last 2,000 years. And how we're going to be beyond the second millennium. We are on this journey to go into the next millennium. We've had greatness in the seventh century by way of the building of the largest Buddhist temple by the Shalendra dynasty. It took 75 years to build, between 650 and 725. We've had another greatness in the context of the Majapahit kingdom, which was really 
a regional economic and maritime architecture which was recognized by the region in a big way. Then we kind of like slowed down for 700 years. And now we're back in the 21st century where we might be seeing the new kind of greatness. I think we do. This is a lot of history, but I've got to catch a flight. Shalendra dynasty, a little piece of information. The guy, there was a guy by the name of Jinbun. Anybody know who Jinbun is? He was the Chinese name of Raden Patah, who was born in Damak, central Java, that actually laid the foundation for the founding of what is now known as the Mataram kingdom, which became the great Islamic kingdom in central Java. And a number of the Wali Songos, the nine saints of Islam in Indonesia, are actually Chinese. Jinbun founded the Mataram dynasty. This speaks of the diversity and the richness of the diversity of this nation of 250 million people, which has had a good taste of peace and stability for 2,000 years. Why would I think that it's not going to continue? Absolutely not. If we've had relative peace and stability for 2,000 years by way of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, I deny and I defy anybody who thinks that Indonesia is likely to be shaken because the core of our soul is that of peace and stability and diversity, which is why the thesis of Indonesia in the next 28 years until 2045 should be a pretty staggeringly interesting one. Can't move this. I highlighted this in the last year's presentation. The number has changed a bit. But what I want to highlight is our marginal productivity on a PPP basis, PPP adjusted basis, is at $23,000. That's the amount of goods and services the average Indonesian can produce vis-a-vis -vis Singapore at $125,000. So imagine a bilateral trade agreement between Singapore and Indonesia. Who do you think is going to win? The guy that's more marginally productive, right? But it's OK. You take the 20, 30 year view. There is no reason for us not to be able to ramp up the $23,000 of goods and services on average per person to a much larger number. We're only spending $8 on R&D per person per year. Singapore is spending $1,600. So anybody that's spending $1,600 per person per year on research and development, I think ought to be moving faster than the other guy that's only spending $8 per year per person. But it's okay. You just got to make sure that this guy tomorrow will have access to patient capital. That $8 is only going to move up as soon as fintech is going to come about, which is already. Middle class, 80 million in a couple of years' time. We're going to comprise about 43% of the population of ASEAN, of the GDP of ASEAN, and of the middle class of ASEAN. Indonesia is going to be a crucial part of the inertia of ASEAN. When ASEAN speaks with other members of the economic universe, We've taken a staggering number of people out of poverty. Go back to 1998, we had 130 million or more living with $2 a day or less. Can you imagine that? It was only 19 years ago that we had more than 130 million people living with $2 a day. Now, we only have 20 million. As of 2014, 21 million. But now we only have 20 million people living with $2 a day or less. You've taken 110 million people out of poverty. That's an amazing feat. 
it speaks of the momentum and the inertia that Indonesia is characterized with. We've got close to half a million kilometers of roads. Where do we want to be in 2045? We want to be at 2 million kilometers of roads. We're at 730 kilowatt hour per capita of electric consumption. We want to be at the 15 to 20,000 kilowatt hour. Singapore is already at close to 9,000 kilowatt hour per capita of electric consumption. If we want to be a developed country, we've got to be at the 15 to 20,000 kilowatt hour per capita of electric consumption. We're still at the 730. We're at the 36% of financial inclusion. Rest assured, with lots of the conversations that we're seeing and hearing in the fintech space, that needle is going to move up to 50 and 60 in the next couple of years. That needle moved up by a couple of notches only in 10 years. In the last 10 years, it only moved up a few notches. But rest assured, by way of the conversations on technology, how people are going to be able to apply not only digital, but also machine learning and artificial intelligence, that needle is going to move up fast. And that guy in Wamena, in Pulau Samosir, in Toraja, those guys are not going to be able to access capital. Peer-to-peer -peer is going to be part of the conversation. A guy that needs money for $100 in Jimber is going to be able to basically borrow from anybody in this room over the handphone at a cost that is so significantly lower than if he or she were to go to the bank. That's already happening in a big way in China. That's going to happen in this place. We have a great population. We have a great number of universities. We have a great number of university students. We just need to make sure that we get good quality of students. We get good quality of teachers. Here's the number. If we were to spend 20% of the government budget every year for the next 28 years, the future value of the educational spending by the Indonesian government, aside from the private sector, is $5 trillion. That's the future value of how much money is going to go into the educational space by the government. At 20% of the government budget, assuming only 12% tax ratio. That's the ratio of tax versus GDP. The typical OECD country is at about 33%. So if we were to sensitize that ratio, and the tax amnesty has done great in terms of increasing the tax ratio, if we were to sensitize that all the way to 25%, not even 33%, by the year 2045, we're going to be able to spend 10.5 trillion US dollars. Now with 5 trillion US dollars, we're going to be able to send 50 million people for a one year high quality education at the likes of Gajamada, ITB, Cambridge, Oxford, MIT, Stanford, and all the Ivy League schools. It's game changing. And that's happening already. We just got to make sure that the right number of people have the right kind of aptitude to go to these great universities. And we've just got to make sure that there is a proper allocation of resource in terms of how much goes for OPEX and how much goes for CAPEX. In some places, people don't know the difference between CAPEX and OPEX. But if they do, I think more spending on CAPEX and more smart spending on OPEX will definitely take us to the right place in terms of the educational space role for the future of Indonesia. Infrastructure. If we were to spend 5%, this year alone we're spending a staggering amount of money on infrastructure, $30 billion. It's close to 15% of the government budget. But if we were to just spend 5% per year going forward until the year 2045, we're going to have 1.3 trillion US dollars to build the bridges, the roads, the power plant, the port capabilities, and the airport capabilities. You think we can't go from 50,000 megawatts existing today to 1 million megawatts? Mathematically, it is doable. The money is there. 
And imagine if we were to be able to sensitize the tax ratio to a greater percentage, we're only going to be able to spend more money for things that are going to be good for the future of Indonesia and Indonesians. Disruption and dislocation I've talked about. Will the future technological disruption lead to a social inequity or equity? You have the answers. But I think what we've got to address is it's not just the Gini ratio. Our Gini ratio is at 40% already, which reflects upon the gap between the haves and the have-nots. But what doesn't get measured is the wealth gap. The wealth gap relates to the extent to which the oligarchs have an influence over policy making. That is something that needs to be captured in the conversation. And that is something that needs to be captured in the way we want to shape the future of our country. Regulatory stickiness. If the regulatory oversight is sticky to the past, that's going to create a bit of a tension on how we want to change, how we want to move. That's the picture. I got a cruise. We're going to be the fourth largest GDP in the world in 2045. Where are we going to be? 11 trillion GDP, 320 million people, 35,000 GDP per capita, 2 million kilometers of roads, 1 million megawatts, 4 doctors per 1,000 people. At the moment, we only have 0.2 doctors per 1,000 people. Norway has around 4 doctors per 1,000 people. 4 hospital beds per 1,000 people. Norway has close to 4 hospital beds per 1,000 people. We're going to be financially inclusive at 95% in 2045. At least by way of the digital revolution. We're going to have a tax ratio of 25% at least. We're going to have 150 million tourist arrivals. Indonesia only gets 12 million tourists per year, this year. Malaysia gets 25. Singapore gets 23. Thailand gets 40. I think we have more islands than Singapore. Don't you think? Why? Jurong. Why are we getting fewer than Singapore? It's not because of the lack of points of interest. It's the lack of connectivity. But connectivity, which relates to the hard infrastructure, is not the only thing that we've got to work on. We've got to work on the human capital development. No nation has become developed just by way of spending money on hard infrastructure. All nations that have become developed have greatly focused on the index of human capital development. Bank to GDP ratio of 100%, market cap to GDP ratio of 100%, debt to GDP ratio of less than 50%. We're at 25%. And if we were to spend money continuously on infrastructure and all the great things that are good for the people of Indonesia, we're still going to be at less than 50% GDP of debt to GDP ratio. China has 250 percent debt to GDP ratio. Japan has 250 percent debt to GDP ratio. So we're fiscally healthy, we're fiscally sustainable, and we're also monetarily stable. We're going to be the third largest democracy because the U.S. will still be slightly higher in terms of the size of the population. We're going to have a Gini ratio of 30 percent. ASEAN will continue to be the anchor of peace and stability for the region and the world. We're going to have astronauts in the International Space Station. Ilham will be the father of that program. We're going to be in the top five in the Olympic standing. Not just because of badminton, but because of all sports that we're going to be excellent in. We're going to win 10 Nobel Prize winners. Out of the 600 Nobel Prizes that have been awarded in STEM, i.e. economics, chemistry, physics, and mathematics, only five have been won by Muslims. Let me repeat. Out of the 600 Nobel Prizes, only five Muslims have won. 
There is no reason for us as the largest moderate Muslim country in the world with 320 million people by the year 2045 for us not to only aspire but to actually actualize the finish lane with 10 Nobel Prizes. We're going to win the Soccer World Cup Championship. How about that, huh? Yeah, the future Ronaldo will be born out of Jimber. <laughs> We're going to be able to project soft power. It's not just K-pop, but it's Indo-pop. We're going to be able to win the Academy Awards. We're going to be able to win the Emmy Awards. We're going to be able to win whatever awards that the people the world over will be watching and craving and thirsting for. Our dances are going to be the talk of the planet. Our wayangs are going to be the talk of the planet. As a result, we're going to be part of that journey from Homo sapiens to Homo Deus. Where in Homo Deus, we're going to continue to be in search of immortality, divinity, and happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you.